we don't expand our imagination. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. There's plenty to talk about, and it's not all about the fallout from the election. And we're going to get right to it. We're going to start at the White House, where President Obama just made a statement urging the lame duck Congress to ratify the START Treaty on nuclear weapons. CBS News White House correspondent Mark Noller joins us from there. Plus, a surprising verdict for Ahmed Galani, the first Guantanamo detainee to be tried in civilian court. CBS News Chief Court Justice Correspondent Jan Crawford is going to be here to talk to us about what it means for the Obama administration and the war on terror and closing Guantanamo. And also, then finally, we'll get back to all of that election fallout, and it's still falling out. There's a close race in Alaska that has been maybe called, and uh, Charlie Rangel is waiting to hear his fate in the ethics trial here in Washington. Politico's deputy politics editor Alex Burns has been watching it all and will get his take in a minute. But first, to Mark Noller on the lawn of the White House. Mark, we're going to listen to the president's remarks here about the START Treaty. Very forceful. Um, let's take a look at that now. It is, it is a, a national security imperative that the United States uh, ratify the new START Treaty this year. There is no higher national security priority for the lame duck session of Congress. The stakes for American national security are clear uh, and they are high. The New START Treaty responsibly reduces the number of nuclear weapons and launchers that the United States and Russia deploy while fully maintaining America's nuclear deterrent. If we ratify this treaty, we're going to have a verification regime in place to track Russia's strategic nuclear weapons, including U.S. inspectors on the ground. If we don't, then we don't have a verification regime. No inspectors, no insights into Russia's strategic arsenal, no framework for cooperation between the world's two nuclear superpowers. Mark, it's hard uh, when you hear the president use the word framework so much to get a sense of how urgent this is for him. Um, is this the, a big deal for the president and the White House? I mean, or is this uh, just the kind of thing you have to say when you're getting shut out by the Republicans in this lame duck session? Well, there's no reason to doubt that President Obama believes uh, it is a, an imperative that this treaty get um, ratified before the end of the year during the lame duck session. He's got more Democrats in the Senate than he will have uh, after the first of the year. So his chances of getting the two-thirds necessary to ratify a treaty is better now than it'll be later. Plus, he has given his assurance to President uh, Dmitry Medvedev of Russia that uh, this treaty will be ratified. He negotiated this treaty with Medvedev. Uh, they signed it back in April. Here it is the end of the year. He wants it done. He also makes the case that uh, U.S. national security is at stake if there is no treaty, then there is no U.S. inspection team looking out and verifying the Russian nuclear arsenal. He thinks that's a crucial point, and that's why he wants the uh, treaty ratified now. Okay, so Mark, he's got to get 67 votes, and there's not much time. They're going to go home for Thanksgiving. Then uh, Congress will be back maybe till the 10th or so of December. Time is drawing close. What's the, okay, we've got a sense of his urgency, but I mean, are they, who are they putting the screws to? Do you get a sense that they're, uh, you know, the president's going to make, go up to the hill? I mean, are they going to really pour it all on here to get something uh, passed? Well, Obama's going to do what he can to get it passed, but today he announced that he was assigning Vice President Biden, who was sitting next to him in the uh, meeting today, to focus day and night, those were the president's words, day and night on getting the treaty ratified. Uh, Biden smiled when he said it, but it's clear that v Biden had his marching orders. As a former longtime member of the United States Senate, Biden is probably the best person in the administration to use his uh, influence to try and get the treaty ratified now. And finally, Mark, he's, the president's got some allies on the Republican side uh, in this fight, doesn't he? Uh, he's got some uh, allies and he's got some opponents on the Republican side uh, for the uh, treaty. It was uh, a statement earlier in the week by Senator John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, who said uh, he doesn't think there's time to uh, take up the treaty 
and give it the proper debate this year. Senator Harry Reid, the majority leader, says no, there is time to do it. And we're going to have a very good assessment of President Obama's clout in the post-election era of whether he gets this treaty done or not. When he says there is no more important national security priority than getting the treaty ratified, he is certainly putting his clout, power, and prestige on the line. That's absolutely right. All right, Mark Noller, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. And now Alex Burns of Politico has been watching this and the other issues. Alex, I want to get your sense of the environment in which this lame duck environment the president's got to operate in now. Uh, Republicans don't seem like they're in a mood to, uh, to really help him out on much of anything. Well, that's absolutely right. And even on the issue of start, a number of the uh, Republican uh, senators elect, folks like Roy Blunt from Missouri, Marco Rubio from Florida, have already released a statement saying uh, they don't want this treaty to go through right now. You know, wait until the new uh, Senate takes uh, t new members of the Senate take their seats. Uh, that's obviously a, a difficult uh, request for the president to navigate, because on the one hand, uh, you don't want to uh, irritate these folks who are going to be important, uh, possibly persuadable votes in the new Senate. And on the other hand, uh, many of them are less likely to uh, vote in favor of this treaty than the folks we're in right now. And, you know, this, we, this was supposed to be the day of the beginning of the new era. The president was going to sit down with congressional leaders from both parties. Uh, that meeting didn't happen. Um, it seems a pretty grim uh, sense of things if they can't even agree on a meeting time. It's now going to take place 10 days from now. Um, is that a big deal that they couldn't even get their act together uh, to, to hold a meeting or are both sides uh, playing it down? Sure. Well, I think it's tough in situations like this to, to exactly ascertain whether there genuinely was a scheduling problem uh, or whether uh, one side snubbed the other. But clearly the, the people who are most directly involved in this are, are making quite a big deal out of it. As Steny Hoyer uh, saying just today uh, that in eight years of the Bush administration, congressional Democrats never uh, canceled on the Republican president. Uh, so you know, even if it is uh, you know, maybe a little bit blown out of proportion, uh, clearly the people who are, are closest to the issue are taking it seriously and personally. And uh, you mentioned Steny Hoyer. He has basically been reelected to the spot he had now, of course, in the minority, but uh, reelected to the spot that he had when he was in the majority. The, the leadership teams look pretty much the same on both sides, don't they? Well, they sure do. And on the Democratic side, that required, you know, some uh, level of acrobatics in order to make sure that uh, you could keep all members of a leadership team, despite the fact that you uh, no longer have the office of the speaker uh, where you could put Nancy Pelosi. Now, Steny Hoyer, I think, is an interesting case going into this next Congress, that you know, he's someone who uh, sort of always the bridesmaid in these situations, you know, is viewed as a, a potential successor to Pelosi if she stepped down in the Democratic leadership, which she obviously did not. Uh, but the votes yesterday uh, show that there's still some discomfort with her in the leadership. Forty-three uh, members of the Democratic caucus voted for somebody else, uh, fairly obscure uh, House member from North Carolina to be the Democratic leader, which shows there's some trust issues that maybe someone like Steny Hoyer could help resolve. And talk about your trust issues. Uh, Charlie Rangel of New York, uh, the outgoing head of the Ways and Means Committee, is right now hearing about his fate. Uh, how do you think that's going to play out uh, here as, as Charlie Rangel uh, is now speaking uh, to uh, his prosecutors? And uh, how, do you, how do you see that shaking out? Well, you know, I think that the, the toughest question here is what exactly Charlie Rangel wants out of all of this. You know, he used to be, the, as you said, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He's lost all of that power uh, thanks to the turnover of Congress. And even before Congress turned over, uh, he already stepped down from that post. So it seems like at this point, Charlie Rangel might uh, just be hoping to uh, maybe leave the House on his own terms rather than being uh, kicked out by the voters or booted out by a committee. If he can survive, it'll be interesting to see whether he actually wants to serve out his term or maybe quietly uh, step aside at some point uh, next year. Okay, Alex Burns, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. And now finally, we've got Jan Crawford to explain what this verdict in the Ahmed Galani case means. First, just set the table for us. What was this case about and what happened? Well, you know, the, the government announced with great fanfare that he was going to be brought up from Guantanamo to be tried here on charges that he was a key player in the embassy bombings that killed 224 people in East Africa. And this was really the test case for whether we could try these Guantanamo detainees, who some of them had been subjected to aggressive interrogation techniques, detained without access to a lawyer for many years, whether we could try them in a United States federal court, give them full access to the rights in our criminal justice system. The Obama administration, of course, insisted this was the right way to go. Uh, they saw it as a way of restoring people's confidence in our criminal justice system. They believed that Guantanamo was this black hole uh, that had tainted uh, the United States reputation abroad. This was a way of salvaging that. Well, of course, last night, uh, about 6, 6.15, uh, the verdict was announced, and it was an enormous setback 
for the government in what really was the test case. He was acquitted on all but one of the charges. That is how close, that, that shows how close he came to getting off, which have raised, I think, what really was the doomsday scenario. And there were a basket full of charges, right? It was 250 some odd charges. He got off of all of them but all that the one. All the murder charges, all the serious conspiracy charges that carried with him minimum life in prison. He was convicted on one conspiracy charge of trying to blow up government property, the U.S. embassies. Uh, that carries a, a life sentence, uh, but there's a minimum sentence attached to that. He could get 20 years in prison when he's sentenced on January 25th. And like I said, that's the doomsday scenario. Uh, that's the thing that, you know, critics of this plan to, to bring these Guantanamo terror suspects to the United States has said, well, what if they're acquitted? Uh, what then? And of course, everyone said, well, you know, in the one in a million chance, the one in a billion chance, the inconceivable uh, possibility that that would ever happen, we'll detain them anyway. So right, we're, which, gonna, we're, we're just going to hold them. We're which, not going to release them. Which doesn't seem to be a shining example of the justice system. Here's a fair, fair trial, but even if, you even if you win, you lose. Right. So this case, I think, shows that that is a reality. Uh, that's a, that is a reality. This was considered one of, I think, one of the easier cases to prove. That's why they rolled it out first. He had been indicted uh, already before he was even sent to Guantanamo. So I, I think we, we can take uh, one big lesson from this case, that, that that's a serious question. What if these guys uh, are indicted or they get a light sentence? Then what do you do with them when they're, they're due to be released? And if you're going to hold them anyway or send them back to Guantanamo, why are we driving down this road? of bringing them into the United States for trial. And so what's the administration say? What, they're trying to put a good face on it. What's their? They're emphasizing, of course, that, well, he was convicted. You know, it's kind of like Al Capone on, on tax evasion charges. We got our guy. He's convicted. Uh, but they really can't get around the fact that, that there is this reality out there. And this case, I think, is, is going to stand for that, that it is a serious question of what if he had gotten off. One you know, one charge he was convicted on. So, you know, we haven't heard from them on whether or not or how this will affect their plans. Obviously, they're studying what to do with some of those high value detainees in Guantanamo. They'd announced, of course, they were going to try the top five suspects in New York, remember, and mm -hmm. including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the self-confessed mastermind of 9-11. Um, uh, they peeled back on that plan when there was enormous opposition, including from the mayor of New York and senators, in addition to Republicans all over the country. Uh, so they're rethinking that, what they're going to do. Uh, I think that plan was on really shaky legs. And, and this may have just locked the last leg out from under it. What was it, uh, why was it so close? I mean, what, what, did the lawyers do a bad job? Did he have some kind of Perry Mason on his side? What was the? This raises uh, and shows that these cases are complicated. Mm -hmm. You've got evidence that was either picked up on a battlefield or, or gathered through uh, pretty aggressive interrogations. The judge excluded some evidence that would have drink, directly linked him uh, to the TNT that was used in the bombings because they were gathered uh, through some aggressive interrogation techniques while he was at Guantanamo. So these are not easy cases. They're not traditional criminal cases. You don't have this chain of evidence where you're getting wiretaps and bank records and warrants. You've got, in, in many of these cases, soldiers going out on the battlefield, picking these guys up. Uh, it, it's not easy to prove. And, and uh, we know from our producer inside uh, the courtroom uh, that there was also, there's also been reports that there was a holdout juror. So you don't know what these juries are going to do. Right. Totally you, know, you never know. Totally unpredictable. The fact that the, the information that was uh, obtained through these harsh inter interrogation techniques, what some people called torture, um, e e politically that doesn't help. But some uh, Democrats would say, well, you know, it could have been okay. We could have had a real trial here. But because of the torture, it makes it impossible to... Uh, to try these kinds of cases. Is that, uh, is that does that argument hold? No, there are different arguments, and, and of course, uh, many people have argued that they should be done through a military commission where there are different, slightly different rules of evidence there that takes into account some of these uh, very concerns because you can focus on how some of this information was gathered, but I think we've got to remember the time frame that it was picked up in. I mean, we were, we had been under attack as a nation. Uh, people were trying to figure out who did this, and so they went about, they weren't thinking about prosecuting these guys. They were thinking about stopping another attack. And so now, 10 years out, to try to shoehorn them into the criminal justice system as if they were some drug dealer standing on the, the sidewalk uh, in, in, a, in a homicide case is not an easy thing to do. And I think this case makes that very clear. Indeed. All right, Jan Crawford, thanks so much. That's it for Washington Unplugged. Join us here every day at 1230 on CBSNews.com. I'm John Dickerson. Have a great day.